Well, good morning. Welcome to Christ Lutheran Church. Welcome to our worship service. Um, Udi is our producer, director, and guitar player for one song today. He's making his debut for us. And um, Mark has a sore throat. So then there were three. <laughs> well, yeah, I am. I'm doing that. Yeah, this is Sue. Hi, I'm Sue. My wife. She's the uh, uh, Christian Education Director here at Christ Lutheran Church. So if you've never been to our worship service, never been to our church, um, we're located in the Piedmont Heights area on uh, 2415 Essence Street. So um, please come when we open up again, and we pray that that will be soon. So welcome to our worship service this morning. Um, I would just like to open with a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you now. We lift you up. We lift you up and we, we come to worship. We come to bow down and worship you. We come to exalt you and praise your holy name. Be with us, guide us, and direct us during this worship service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have any prayer requests, you can go online there and enter them in. They will be kept. And after our worship service is over with today, then um, we will write those down from, uh, from Facebook and we will definitely begin to pray for you. Um, so let us begin with our confession and absolution. And uh, we'll begin that right now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess that we are bonded to sin, and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake, forgive you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening psalm this morning is, Here I Am to Worship. So this is our first time, folks, so I have to turn the camera around to get everybody in the shot. There we go. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Here I am to worship. As we sing, worship with us, and enjoy the presence of the Lord with you wherever you are. Amen.
So, hey, thank you, Lee. First time playing with us. All right. Amen. That was great. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you very much, Lee. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Go back to my real job over here. Back to real job. All right. We're playing or? We're going over. That's right. Now we're going back to the chairs. To the chairs. This is me. Right. What we're going to do this morning is, is share with you from um, the lectionary readings this morning. They are from Isaiah 42, verses 14 through 21. The gradual is Psalm 142. And the New Testament reading is Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. And um, the gospel lesson is taken from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. So our first reading is from Isaiah. And it goes like this. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up their pools. And I will lead the blind in the way they do not know. In paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear ye deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, for death is my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased, for his righteousness' sake, to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Use your mind. <laughs> Thanks be to God. It's on. Testing one, two, okay, three. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay. You know, we talked about this last night as we were, you know, reading through the scripture lessons. And um, do you remember what we were talking about? Isaiah 42 talks about God's servant. And during this time, um, Cyrus was going to be, the, to be seen as the deliverer of Israel to bring them back. And Cyrus was a type of Christ. And so we see here that the idea or the whole theme of our scripture lessons today are darkness and light, blindness and sight. Okay. And um, so uh, as we talked about it last night, you brought up some interesting points. Well, you know, right at the beginning of the reading, this is what it says. It says, for a long time I've held my peace. I've kept still and restrained, he restrained myself, but now I'll cry like a woman in labor. So I, I say to pastor, wow, that's an interesting image. Here's the Lord speaking as a woman who's about to deliver a child, a woman who's in dis the distress of labor. And so then it was like, what's caused this dramatic change in the, in the Lord and his, in what he's saying? So when we go back, Just a little bit earlier in the same chapter of Isaiah, we hear about the prophecy about the Lord, the one who's actually going to come and open the eyes of the blind and release prisoners from darkness. The one that's going to come and save us. And then the Lord says, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. So now it's, so we've got the prophecy of the Lord coming and a, and a direction to praise him. And this all sounds good. This is the good news, the gospel. And suddenly in, in uh, verse 14, now it, the, the Lord says, 
For a long time, I've held my peace. Now I'm going to cry out like a woman in labor. And then as we read through the next part that Pastor read at the beginning, the actual reading for the day, we see that there are people in darkness. They've turned to idols. And the Lord says, Pastor, in verse 18, where it says, Hear, you deaf and look, you blind, that you may see. And when we were talking last night, these are people who think they can see. These are people who think they hear and understand. But no, no, they still are worshiping idols. And the Lord has said, I had enough. And he starts to cry out. In verse 22, it says, But this people is a plundered and, and, and looted. They are all of them. They are all of them trapped in holes, hidden in prisons. Um, one, of the, one of the things that Isaiah talked about and Ezekiel talked about was being robbed and looted by their own shepherds. So we see this picture here that even though Israel was in disobedience, they weren't corrected by their own, their own shepherds. And so God had to bring prophets in to, um, to speak to the shepherds on behalf of the Lord and tell the people what he is going to do in, in sending them and being forgiving of them all the time. You know, one thing about this is that we, we have to realize that even though sometimes we're disobedient, God is always faithful. When we're not faithful, God is always faithful. And, and God is telling us this here. He is saying, you know, I will restore. He is the one that is going to make us see. He's the one that's going to give us perception. He is the one that's going to enlighten us. He is going to enable us to hear him in this point. Amen. 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 Um, you want to read the gradual? When Pastor says the gradual, those of you who go to church with us know that that's making a reference to um, that gradual ascent up the steps to the temple of the Lord that the Jewish people did when they went into worship. So we make that, we use that term gradual, but it's always referring to one of the Psalms, and I'll be reading Psalm 142. And it's called a masculine of David. A masculine is that song or writing which is supposed to show wisdom or give you wisdom and understanding. All right, Psalm 142. With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they've hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There's none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Amen. I don't know if any of you have ever complained to a friend. I might have done that yesterday. I might have taken all of my troubles and complaints to my sister on the phone, very, very upset and worried. And then, when we sat down to review this verse again last night, I was convicted by the Lord that he wants me to take my concerns and my troubles and my complaints to him. He wants me to pour my heart out to him. He wants me to cry out to him. And the same is true for you. So we encourage you today that if you have troubles, and we know right now that there are troubles all around us, and yet, the ones we struggle the most with are the ones in our own hearts. So I encourage you today, take your complaint to the Lord. And it's never wrong to, to counsel with a friend. But sometimes we can put those friends and family members before God. He's our first hearer, our first deliverer, our first savior. The one who loves us the most. 
Yeah. He's our only Savior, not just our first. He's the only. He's no, the one no, and only. You know, right? You know, okay. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, when you're in a pit, you need a helping hand to get out. Yeah. A regular flesh and blood helping hand. You know, it's interesting. You actually missed a few um, lines there. Go read them for us. Well, it says, A masculine of David, when he was in the cave, a prayer. He was in a cave. He was in darkness. The whole theme of these readings is darkness and light, sight and blindness, or blindness and sight. David was in a cave. It was dark in there, probably with a little fire going, but it was dark. So like not his happy place. Not a happy place. And when he starts to pray, he pours out his complaint. And he says, I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know the way, he says. And then he, he gives his complaint in the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, there is none who take notice of me. No refuge remains in me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. So there's his, there's his complaint. There's his discouragement. He's laying it all out to the Lord. And then he changes. When he speaks to the Lord, he says, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. living. Intent, attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, those who are setting a trap for me. For they are too strong for me. He can't fight them all. Bring me out of prison, then I may give thanks to your name. He's stuck in a cave. He's afraid for his life. And he's asking to be delivered. Then he says, the righteous will surround me. For you will deal bountifully with me. Bountifully with me. When you're in your house, when you're in your house, remember that the righteous surround you. Those that have gone before you, being with the Lord and those of us who are connected to you by the Holy Spirit. You are never, ever alone because the righteous always surround you and God's righteousness surrounds you as well because you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You have the most holy trinity living within you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit living in your heart. Because Jesus says, we will come to you and make our home, our abode in you. What a wonderful promise. You have a big God dwelling inside of you. What's that song about? My, My God, God is, is a big God. God. He walks upon the waters. My, My God is a big God. But small enough to live in me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yes, he is. Okay, to our epistle lesson. Um, he says, Paul says, he's writing to the church in Ephesus. Okay. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, when we were talking about this last night, I said, Sue, here's a really important, uh, for, this is something really important for you to understand. Paul says to the Ephesians, you were darkness. He did not say you were in darkness. You were darkness. You were dead in your sins. You did nothing but sin. You were controlled completely by your sinful nature. But now, he says, you are light. 
you are light in the Lord. So in our gospel lesson, in just a few minutes, we'll read, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But then in Matthew 5, 14, he says to the disciples, you are the light of the world. So what happened? What does that mean? So, and, 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 and Sue was asking me last night, he says, well, well how are we light? Right? Is, is that what you asked? Remember, I made that, I gave that silly movie <clears throat> example about light shining out of your hands, but you know, the light mm -hmm. is in us through faith in Jesus Christ. How do we, oh, it was, you, you talked about, she talked, Pastor talked about, um, you know, the light that's under a bushel basket, and then we take the light out from under the uh, black basket and you set it up so that all can see. And I said, well, that's a metaphor. How do we actually do that? How do we actually show the light that's in us? And then, we then, then I said, okay, well, we live like Christ, we behave like Christ, we act like Christ, we talk like Christ. What is that, Sue said? That's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. And what does Paul then to say? Walk as children of light. That means your behavior should be as children of light. Why? For, because the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true. Jesus teaches us and the Holy Spirit is transforming our lives day by day into doing what is good, right, and true. And think about that. The Ten Commandments. Those are things that are good, right, and true. Loving, having no other gods before you, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall have, you know, no carved images. There are no other gods before you. Only one God. And then the rest of the next commandments have to do with treating our neighbor good, right, and true. Loving our neighbor as ourselves and loving. So remember I've taught you this, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength will enable you to love your neighbor as yourself. And it goes, it's that, that circle of love that keeps going around and around. Oh, that circle of love. The circle of love, not the circle of God. No Lion King here today, okay? That's not where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So, anything else on that? No, no, we covered, no, it. We covered it. So, here's the thing, folks. Um, he says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. So, when we receive, you know, Christ, when he comes to dwell within us through faith in him, we become children of light. And as we'll see here in, in John's Gospel, um, we'll figure out what that means for us to shine as lights for Christ. I have, I have a question. Yeah. Now, did you send the readings for Sunday out to folks? Yes, so I did. Have... And I sent, the, I sent the actual, the summary too. So keep that in mind, those of you who attend Christ Lutheran Church, that you've already received the readings and the summary, if you want to visit those again yep. um, uh, after church, for some of your own personal devotion time, but also for those of you who don't attend Christ Lutheran Church, I just want to take a moment and give you those references again. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you want to, uh, here, I'm going to count to ten. Grab a pen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so if you have a pen or pencil in hand, write these down. It's Isaiah 42, 14 through 21. I'll say that again, Isaiah 42, 14 through 21. And then the song that we did was Psalm 142. Our New Testament reading was from Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 14. And I'll say that again, Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 14. John. And finally, the gospel. Mm -hmm. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. And now we're going to... Um, Lead you into some more worship via music and song. This uh, this next song. Things. It's an old worship tune by Billy Funk. If you can believe it, it's called Be Glorified. I just love this song. 
Stroke a chord. Could you sing, please? Stroke a chord. Be and on each of us to come and heal us and to cleanse us. So we're going to sing a song that's called Lord, uh, uh, Lord Have Mercy on Us. Get down on your knees and then you pray that the Lord. 
Lord would have mercy on you, on your family, and that you take all your cares and concerns to him, all right? The Jesus Prayer is a very simple prayer. It goes like this. It's taken from the prayer of the publican, where the tax collector was at the praying a wall outside Jerusalem, where they all prayed in public, and where he said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. The Jesus Prayer was begun in the early church, and it goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. So if you have sinned and the Holy Spirit has convicted you, pray that prayer. If someone is in trouble that you know, pray that prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on whoever it is. And if you're in struggle, if you're in doubt, if you're in turmoil, in turmoil, if you're worried, if you're concerned, pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. I need your help. What you're doing is that, first of all, you're invoking the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Son of God, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, the Word incarnate. And then you ask him where he stands at the mercy seat to have mercy upon him. Because he is merciful and good. Because he has, he has sprinkled his blood upon the mercy seat in heaven. The, the holy sanctuary, the real sanctuary in heaven to cover your sins. And so if you're sick, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Heal me. This is Jesus' prayer. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Our next song is Thy Word by uh, Amy Grant and Ready? Mm -hmm.
thank you, Lord, for your word and for all your promises that are true. They are yes and amen. Yes and amen. You want me to come up there with you? Our gospel lesson for today is taken from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. So he went and washed and came back seen. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. So they said to him, Then how are your eyes open? And he answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, what did you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. As his parents said these things, because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that I was blind and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you, why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why is this an amazing thing? You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of, a worshiper of God and, and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, 
he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. <laughs> Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd just like to share a few things with you from um, John 9, uh, 1 through 41. And let's start at the first verse here. Verse, well, actually verse 3, where it says, Jesus answered, And it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God may be displayed in him. Jesus said these things like this in a way in which he makes you think about what he's saying. And John writes this several times this way in his gospel. And what Jesus is saying and how he is saying is called an ellipsis. That means he omitted words or sentences in what he said for a purpose. So where he says, where he says, it was not this man that sinned or his parents, but he was born blind in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. So we see that Jesus is saying, the answer to their question was, God's purpose in this man being blind was to give God the glory for healing him. Now it is true, and it is scriptural, that sometimes when people sin, God will discipline them with a sickness. Or, in order um, to lead people to repentance, sometimes God does things like that. And a few Sundays ago, we talked about this when, we, when I uh, first wanted to share some things with you about the coronavirus and, and what, you know, what God's, you know, what, what is God's purpose in this? What, is, what, what happens when things like this occur? And so Jesus is telling them, this man didn't sin, their parents didn't sin. He was born blind to, for me to come and heal him so God would get the glory. That's the reason why. Okay? So, so that's in verse 3. And in verse 4 and 5, here's another, here's another interesting point. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The first thing that, that crossed my mind here is that all over the United States, a lot of people are out of work. And this is a dark time for them. They see it as a dark time. But what is Jesus saying here? What is Jesus saying here? While it is day, Jesus is the light of the world. And in verse 5, he says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as I am here, he says, I am the light of the world. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world here. And so in Matthew 5.14, he says to the disciples that you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, 
so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father which is in heaven. So Jesus is telling the disciples here and you and I that while he was here, he is the light of the world. But the disciples now, and you and I Christians, are now the light of the world. What is interesting about this word, you are the light, light used here, means to emanate, to emit a light. What does that mean, Pastor? It's not like you turn on a light. No. What it means is, is that Christians have Christ dwelling within us. He is the light of the world. And what we are to do is to emit that light like a beacon. When I first started here at Christ Lutheran Church, the Lord gave me a vision of Christ Lutheran Church being a beacon throughout this area on a hill so everyone can see the gospel of Jesus Christ coming from Christ Lutheran Church being a beacon, being a beacon, emitting the light of the gospel, emitting the light of the gospel for the whole world to see. And so we are to emit, to shine forth the light of Christ within us to the world who is in darkness, the world right now in dark times. If we go on to verse 35 through 39, we, we see what Jesus says here. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, the man who he had healed. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Well, who is it? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and he is who is speaking to you. It is he who is speaking to you. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to you this morning. If you do not believe, Jesus Christ is speaking to you this morning. He is speaking to your heart this morning through his gospel, through the readings. He is speaking to you through the songs that we've sung. He is calling you to himself. He's calling you to faith. He's calling you to faith in him. Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? was buried, rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, who sits at the right hand of the majesty of God. If you don't, believe in him today. Ask God to give you the faith to believe in him today. Going further here, Jesus says, for judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. What on earth is Jesus saying here? Because in John 3, 17, he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But he also goes on to say, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. What Jesus is saying here, and what this means, when in the original language the, the word used, is used for judgment, okay, in other words, it is the result of judgment. Just what John wrote in the third chapter, where he says that those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who reject him are condemned already. You see? There's a big difference here. It's not that Jesus is coming to condemn the world. No. What he says is that if you reject me, you're condemned already. Judgment has already been passed upon you. Because the result of judgment is those who do not see receive sight 
because they have believed in the Son of God. And those who see, who think they see, become blind because of their rejection of the Savior, because of their own self-righteousness, because of their sinfulness and rebellion against God. And those who, quote, say they see now are those who profess to see but are actually blind. They profess to see, but they're actually blind. So that is why Jesus came. He says, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, those who believe in me may see, and those who see may become blind. In the King James Version and the other versions, it says that um, they are made blind. But, but actually it means they become blind through their rejection. So in other words, in closing here, we look at verse 41. It says, and Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt or sin. Actually, the word is sin, amartia in the Greek. So if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Okay? Another part of God's purpose, which is the wrath or curse on those who blaspheme and reject the Son, the Messiah. And what, what we're saying here in closing is, the darkness is incurable when the only cure is rejected. You see? And that cure is Jesus Christ. The darkness is incurable when the only cure is rejected. That's like if they find a vaccine for the coronavirus and say, this works, we know it for sure, it's all bedded and everything, all you need is a shot to be cured, and you re refuse it, then you won't be cured. You'll die from the disease. And sin is a disease, it's a disease of our nature. And so the cure has been, has been given in Jesus Christ. So turn from your sin to faith in Christ. Receive the cure and be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. We may go over a little bit, and I don't think that's going to be a problem. But um, we're going to pray right now. And I want you to join me in prayer in this time uh, right now that, um, and our closing song is called the benediction, but let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace now, and we ask God that those who are blind, they may see, and those that profess to see, that they receive sight that they really see for the first time in their lives the cure of the sickness of sin. God, that they would transition from darkness to light, that they would be beacons themselves, that Christ would live in them, the light of the world. Father, I pray for all of us from Christ Lutheran Church that you protect them, put a hedgerow of protection around each and every um, Christian that belongs to Christ Lutheran Church. Father, I pray for protection for each and every person in our community, in our society, in our state, in our country, God, that you would bring those that are sick to healing. Father, that you would, that you would have mercy upon this country, that uh, the cure would come and people would be healed, that we would be protected by the cure. Father, we pray for those that are shut in, that those are in uh, nursing homes or assisted living. Father, we pray for them that you would give them your presence like it's never been uh, felt by them before. God, that they would know that you are there and that they are not alone. So, Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise um, for everything that you've done for us. We pray for those that have lost loved ones in the recent past. 
And we pray for those that have lost loved ones, loved ones to this illness that's going around, God, that we give them comfort and hope. We pray for the, um, the family of Shirley Kern who just passed away, the Oshaki family. Um, and uh, we just ask for your comfort and consolation and solace in them as well. We lift these prayers up to you, God. We cry out to you, Father, for your mercy and your compassion upon us all. We pray in Jesus' name.